On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Ryan Glasgow. He is the CEO at Sprig. We're going to be talking about his journey from pre-Spig to launching the company. Ryan focused deeply on building products for others, especially on experience data. Experience is a core of everything you're going to hear him talk about and learn about how it is the cornerstone of Sprig and how the product helps people. I mean, Ryan's going to cover a lot for us and hopefully I'll fit all of it in. Ryan, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Excited to dig in today. Okay. I know I'm going to try to bite off more than I can probably cover, but we're going to try to get as much of it in as we can. Before we start, let's tell everyone what the company does. Can, can you tell, what, tell us what Sprig does? Sprig is a product experience insights platform. And what that means is that we help companies understand what their customers think of their products. We have four different products to do that, to help these companies understand what their customers think. And the first one is in product surveys. This is really our core product. And we dig into the early days of Sprig, certainly a key part of the story. The second one we launched this year is session replay. And so recording the user screen, seeing where they get stuck, seeing what's working, not working about their experience. The third one is prototype testing. And so we have a way to take your Figma prototypes and other design prototypes, add them to Sprig, add video, voice questions alongside those prototypes, share those with your customers for feedback. And the fourth one, which we'll, I'm sure I'll also be digging in today, is AI. And so we have ways to understand all this data in real time at different various levels across the entire Sprig platform for an account, down to a specific study to see what's going on with AI, also down to specific questions to deeply understand what's happening within specific questions. And so it's been a key part of our journey since the beginning, but as with many companies, a huge part of our journey this year. So before we start, I was going to, you know, we'll obviously link to your LinkedIn profile, but I did note that, you know, based on what I'd seen um, of the number of you know roles you'd been a part of over your career, quite a number of them <laughs> go on to have an exit of an acquisition. Um, you know, I, I, I look at that and I go, well, this guy obviously understands product. Um, he can see things early. He can evaluate. Don't say you're just lucky because lucky is once or twice, not uh, several times. So, you know, this episode really, I guess, to kind of jump back and kind of focus on that understanding of product, especially pre-sprig, right? So you start your career, you're, you're, you're a product guy, you're seeing people that want to build product. And yet every time you seem to evaluate something unique in a company, I guess, how, what do you attribute that to? Or what do you see when you're, what do you, how do you evaluate that? Because I think that's a great starting point for a product person. You're absolutely right. And I'll I'll say fortunate, maybe instead of lucky. Uh, so I'll, I'll take that. So I have had five successful acqui- uh, exits, all of them as a founding team member. So not as a founder, but a founding team member. And often joined as the first product manager. Some of those I joined pre-product market fit. Some of those I joined post-product market fit. And so Weebly was an example of post-product market fit. It was already quickly growing and I really helped grow to 500, uh, run 400 people as a first product manager. Other companies like Verb that was acquired by Snapchat for 120 million, I joined pre-product market fit in the apartment with the founder. It was just us and you know one or two other people coming up with a product, the company name. There was no company name when I joined. And so it kind of explains how early some of these experiences are. And what I always looked for, you know, ExtraBox acquired by eBay, it's now Rakuten. Uh, that was in coupons and cashback space. Verb, which was acquired by Snapchat, that was in the mobile search space. All the way to Weebly and the popular you know, website uh, builder, which was acquired by Square. And across all those, I really looked for acute customer problems. Something that maybe I didn't feel myself, but I knew that other people experienced. And for example, when I was interviewing at Weebly, they had me do a project to present. I talked to someone from college and he said that he had come up with an idea for a new spice and he couldn't figure out how to sell it online. And Weebly was the only platform that was able to help him really figure out how to sell his spice that he came up with online. And so I looked for these personal acute examples of people experiencing personal transformation 
Um, maybe it's through you know coupons and cashback savings. Maybe it's through building a website. Maybe it's through looking for a new place, a new experience locally with Verb. That's really what I focused on with these companies. And I knew that if I was solving a problem that people cared about, it was really up to us. Us as a team, we could find a way to build something special, make an experience that matters. And it was just a matter of time and effort. And we could grind it out and build something you know, amazing. And all these companies went on to have very strong product market fit, do great things in the world, and then were successfully acquired. But it really came down to a customer problem that people cared about. I guess, you know, you hear a lot of people think they find product market fit um, and, and it always doesn't work out. I find sometimes it's really hard to know if you've actually found the right problem to solve. And I guess in your case, you, you have you have an ability to understand pre post market fit pre company name level uh, involvement, and I guess I understand the customer acute customer problem. But how do you know it's the right problem? Like, how, what process or what do you look at? What lens are you looking at to kind of evaluate that component? This is something that you know. Even in the beginning of Sprig, started to really deeply understand thinking, hey, 10 plus years of my life to really commit to, you have to have a lot of conviction that you're solving a problem that people care about. And so I had to really unpack it and define it as customer problem fit. And so is this a problem that people really care about? And you know, when I was starting Sprig, there were a couple of books that really helped formulate and help con- you know, really formalize my thinking around that. One of them is Competing Against Luck by Clayton Christensen, who's a very famous um, Harvard uh, Business School professor, of this whole concept around solving problems in people's life. And the second one is Outcome Driven Innovation. And Outcome Driven Innovation by Tony Olwick focuses on all the different outcomes that someone's looking for in a product and asking them and measuring on a scale of one to five how important these outcomes are, but also how unsatisfied or satisfied they are with these outcomes for how they're able to be solved by a product that they're using today. And so perhaps you're using, um, going back to an example we might all know, a CD. You buy a CD, you put it in your CD player and you play. You think about some of the things that people are trying to do, the accessibility, instant accessibility of music, and you think about some other outcomes that might be important to people. There was a lot of dissatisfaction around that experience. And a new experience came along that was able to ultimately, you know, have a much higher degree of satisfaction in the outcomes that people cared about. When I looked at Sprig and thinking back to my experiences at these companies, the problem that I was experiencing was that we had really great behavioral data and we knew exactly what our customers were doing. We had really great revenue data. We knew exactly how much our customers were paying us and who and what segments, but we didn't really have that experience data of understanding exactly what customers and specifically specific segments that we deeply cared about as a business, understanding a systematic way what they cared about. And so when I looked at the different problems uh, you know, that I was facing in my career, that was the one that was very consistent across those five companies that you know, I helped scale um, through acquisition. And getting back to your question on product market fit, I always go back to the Sean Ellis framework. This is around 2009, 2010. I had just gotten started on my full-time professional career in technology. And I was working at a startup ExtraVox. And I wanted to measure product market fit. And Sean Ellis' framework had just come out. And it's the question around if how disappointed would you be if this product no longer existed? And if you get above 40%, then it's considered product market fit. 20 to 40% is that area where you have to decide, can we get to 40? Do we shut it down? Do we pivot? Below 20, usually the answer is the path is pretty clear. You have to do something drastically different. I get so tired of people on social media and investors and founders say, you just know when you have product market fit, because that's not actually the case. A lot of companies have incredible product market fit and the product is not being ripped out of their hands. And so it ultimately comes down to the people that are using a product today. How disappointed would they be if they could no longer use your product? 
And going back to customer problem fit, I also apply that same framework starting Sprig around is this a problem that people care about? Yeah, it's interesting. As as you're referencing that, I was thinking immediately to what would I really miss if somebody ripped it out? iPhone is obviously, yeah, my mobile phone, whatever your brand you're using, doesn't matter. But the mobile phone obviously is one. And I immediately was like, oh, dang, this is true. There there are things uh, that you could easily evaluate when you're when you're looking at it from that lens. I guess a question I was going to ask you about kind of this this problem that you started noticing. Obviously, you know, you're focused on acute customer problems, product market fit, data, and that experience data is crucial. How soon or how long ago or how many roles into your career were you starting to take note that this is a consistent issue? Because obviously as, as a product manager, you're you need that data to be able to build your roadmap, advise, you know, to build those customer feedback loops that you're hoping to understand even more data with. But how soon did you start realizing that this was a consistent problem across all these different companies you worked at? I would say the genesis for Sprig came at Weebly. But prior to Weebly, I was deeply invested in understanding what the customer thought of the product that we were building, but also deeply invested in what the customer's problem was. But most importantly, deeply invested in where the customer wanted to go in their life and how our product fit into their journey to get from point A to point B. Because our products are merely vehicles to get a customer from point A to point B. It's really just how important do they want to get to B. And you know, the whatever they're using today to get to B, is it good enough? And can you build something dramatically better to get to point B than whatever they're using today? And when I was at those pre-product market fit companies, we'd have you know, maybe enough users to fit on two hands, three hands, four hands, very small user bases. And I was emailing them very specific one question at a time over email. You sign up. I'm looking at the, the mix panel data. I say they don't come back after a week. Hey, Ryan, product manager here from Verb. We'll love to understand. You know, you tried it out, didn't come back. You know. Help me understand what happened. Maybe they come back five weeks in a row. Hey, looks like you're getting a lot of value out of the product. Help me understand what's most valuable. And when I went to scale that process to Weebly, when we were quickly growing, millions of users, my left 50 million accounts, it obviously broke down. You can't do one-off emails on the who to send it to you, collecting that data, analyzing that data. And security wouldn't even let me. And legal, we had all these teams in place, all this compliance. You can't be reaching out to all these customers, asking all these questions all the time. And that's really when I realized that this process that was so critical, just pre-product market fit ideation, I wanted to apply to post-product market fit company. And so Sprig is focused on helping post-product market fit, quickly grown and at scale companies better understand what their customers think of their products. And that's when you look at our homepage, companies like Notion, Figma, PayPal, Peloton, Coinbase, Robinhood. Some of them have been our, some of our first customers. Some of them just joined recently, but they all deeply care about their user experience. They're all post-product market fit, and they want to understand what how their products fit in their customers' life to help transform each of those individuals you know, one by one. I guess as you're looking at helping companies understand their their customer data, the experience data that 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 hopefully they're they're building out to make these decisions, we always hear about feedback loops. We talk about the survey, and I guess it goes back to making sure you're capturing the right data on the front end. Because I guess you could run surveys, you, you could do all the necessary things, and not capture the right data points to actually make the decisions. How 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 does I guess the product or how do you kind of view the the survey data and how to make sure that you're actually capturing the right question up front? Yeah. We see really two types of customer feedback. There's can you know we'll call it outbound and inbound. And really the one that we all get today is our customers. I've gotten Facebook messages from customers. You know, I've got random text messages, you know, emails to my personal email account. People coming to sales, success, 
reaching out to the product team saying, hey, this is broken. I need help. I'm stuck on this. That's really inbound feedback. And that's interesting, but it often doesn't move the business forward. The piece they're really focused on at Sprig, and I encourage any, anyone listening to make sure that you have in place, is outbound feedback is going out to specific groups of people, you know, whoever your ideal customer profile is as an organization, and looking at the key moments in their journey. It might be onboarding. It could be them trying a new product. It could be them coming up for renewal and focusing on those key high leverage moments and ask how can we help you move forward? How can we help you onboard? How can we help you better understand that new product experience? And so we focused a lot with Sprig on asking very specific questions after someone, for example, completes onboarding, after someone is up for renewal, after someone maybe cancels their subscription. Those are people that you don't hear from. And that's why you have to go out to them to ask them, how was the specific you know, experience that you just had with our product that's incredibly important to us. You might never come back and we might not ever hear from you again, but while we have you, we want to hear from you so that we can make this better for you. And if it's too late, we can make it better for the next person. And so with Sprig, we focus on specific questions to specific people at specific moments in their user journey. And that's ultimately what outbound feedback is. Yeah, you know, it's interesting as as you're kind of mentioning the different groups that you could be reaching out to. I, I guess maybe if you could help us understand, there's different different groups, and then there's going to be different also benefits, right? I guess you know one group or or one way of experience data could be towards churn. You know, you could have adoption, you could have you know growth within the product within an organization. I, I guess there's so many different areas in which you I could kind of see that you know, kind of working hand in hand to the product and the benefit of the customer. Are there different strategies in terms of how you're going to approach potentially the factors you're looking to affect? When we often start working with companies, they might not have any feedback in place or maybe a feedback button. You've probably seen those feedback buttons. You got a, you know, an airline website, there's a feedback button. You can say you hate the design or something. And we that's usually the the 1.0. You're doing something, but you're not really intentional. You're not thoughtful. You're not out, you're not getting into users' minds in those critical high leverage moments. And so the first one is really just the ability to run these in product surveys, build that way to connect with the users in those critical moments. And people that run ad hoc surveys, we call them ad hoc surveys with Sprig, is really the starting point. You're building that dialogue, you're getting intentional, you're getting specific, you're moving beyond just a feedback button. The second level of maturity is exactly what you're talking about, which is critical user journey measurement. And this is something that many of our customers have actually taught us on how they use Sprig, is the best-in-class companies that we work with in terms of user experience management, they look at their five to 10 core user journeys, making a trade, buying stock, selling stock, depositing, maybe building a list of stocks of interest, they have the five to 10 journeys and they run continuous and product surveys at a very, very small sample, 0.1 to maybe 0.25% of the throughput. And on a longitudinal basis, they're looking at the changes in the data that they're getting. Maybe after you make a trade with a you know, stock trading product, how was your trade experience? And it'll rotate through the user bases, but at a very, very small sample, you might get one on a, as an end user once a year, once every other two years, because they're so spread out. But that's really the way that these, these executive teams, these leadership teams, wake up in the morning and they look at their business intelligence dashboards and they're saying, we're making improvements to our user experience because we're measuring our core flows at very, very small samples. And we're seeing progress to user sentiment around our core flows. And that's really where the industry is going, is giving these teams this ongoing longitudinal measurement to see are the changes that the product team is and engineering team is making, the A-B tests, the feature flags, are they moving the user experience forward? Or are they moving the user experience backward? Or is there stagnation in the user's experience? And that's really what we see as uh, a big step forward from what many teams are doing today. I guess when you see 
you know, surveys, obviously the results are very powerful. When, when you're looking at the actual component to get engagement to take the survey, are there methods to help facilitate an improvement on just how many people will take the survey? And people are surprised by this. On average, we see a 30% response rate. And so it really speaks. We have some customers with a 90% response rate. If you have, if you have a very engaged user base, you know, I won't say who from our customer base, but the very passionate, loyal users who deeply care about that product, they want that product to succeed. They want that product to win. Uh, you know, Maybe they've thought about getting a tattoo of the logo on their arm. Those are the ones with the really high response rate. And a lot of us have strong affinities to brands. A lot of that, you know, brands make up our identity. And so that's a great starting point, uh, just having a loyal user base. What we do at Sprig, though, the targeting that we allow with the event-based architecture is extremely targeted. So you can go out to very small groups of people with very advanced logic. But the second one is we have a cooling off period. And what this means is that many of our companies will have a 60, 90, or 120-day resurvey window. And so if you get a, if you just see a survey from Sprig uh, on web, it might wait, our system might wait 180 days before you're even eligible, you know, six months before you're even eligible to see another one on iOS. And by really spreading this around, it makes sure that we're not having any fatigue from the end user base. We always recommend asking these after a flow as well. And so you don't want to be mid sign up flow, punching your email. You don't want to be trying to figure out a difficult task or in the process of creating a new product for your online store. You want to have just added your first product to your online store. You want to have just deposited funds into your account. You want to have just made your fifth trade with that stock trading platform. And after those moments, that's where you see the pause in the user's life. They've just gone through a flow and they actually expect it because they know that you care. They know that you care about what you thought, but you're doing it in an intentional way by giving them, you know, it's a, a, a moment where you can ask them how that experience was. And they're going to have trust in you that you're going to at least listen and hopefully improve upon that experience. So they make their 10th trade. It's even better. Before we get to the AI question, I was, I was actually going to ask you, um, with the survey results, with, with these feedback loops, how do you take that data and then actually make it actionable? Actually, you know, have an impact with that service that that survey data is. Is there something that you're seeing? Is there a certain volume of feedback you need, or or certain trends before you go ahead and go? Hey, we need to start looking at it, the product impact. It's something that we built in where our system automatically determines how many users go through that particular part of your product experience. And it'll determine how many responses you need. So we'll reach 95% confidence interval, which is what we recommend. Usually it's around 300 responses, sometimes more with the larger user base, sometimes less with smaller user base, but generally 300. The survey will automatically complete. The AI sifts through all the results for you and comes back with a summary and actionable specific recommendations to improve that part of the product experience. So the AI does all of the synthesis and analysis. Uh, but the targeting, the collection, how many responses to collect all happens and is determined automatically with some recommendations that can obviously be overridden. I guess as you're you're looking at AI and you're looking at experience data, it, it trying to identify, you kind of mentioned identifying the real core supporters of the product, the people that are willing to get that tattoo. Do you envision the AI component helping find those groups for customers so that they can start seeing those trends of, hey, this is going to be that diehard, you can't rip it out of my hands customer? Absolutely. And what we have right now is it measures the sentiment uh, across all the data um, on the response level and helps look at what we call the uh, strengths. So we actually have a strength insight that is generated from the studies as well as the respondents. So you can see who are those champions? Who are your promoters? And you can then build a list you know, in Sprig of who your promoters are and think about how you actually want to act on this group. 
So can we ask for a G2 review? Can we ask for social media? Can we ask for referrals? This is something that we do here at Sprick. We leverage our promoters and our champions to connect with other companies uh, like them who can also benefit uh, to you know, deeply understand their user experience. It's interesting because um, your your product, as I you know, kind of kind of becoming familiar with it, um, looking for those customers that are going to bring you that proactive feedback because they are the champions, and you have to be able to identify them. It, it seems like you kind of did some of that uh, manually or, or earlier in stages of your career, as you kind of described it. Now you've got a a, a solution that you applied all that learning to, and obviously with AI, it's actually taking a lot of that heavy lifting off. And I kind of was like, that's got to be a, a cool cool thing to kind of look back and see how much progress has been made. It's certainly very meta. You know, and Sprague is really a, a based off of all of my career experience of finding product market fit four times, helping scale another company to, uh, you know, a very large global brand. And it's putting all of those learnings, all of that knowledge, all those late nights of what to ask, when to send that email, when to reach out to people, all of those, you know, all of those learnings are in the defaults of Sprig. How many people to ask, all of our templates, we have over 50 templates to use. Those are many of those are based on questions I would ask in the beginning of my career. And so you're absolutely right. It's the culmination of everything that I've learned. Obviously, with our customers, they've given us amazing feedback. And the early team as well. We brought in some early uh, some researchers as subject matter experts to help craft and shape and make sure that we are really delivering everything uh, according to industry guidelines. Awesome. Uh, Ryan, if if someone does want to reach out to you to, 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 to ask you about Sprig or just ask you about something about product management, um, product market fit, um, is there a good way of someone getting a hold of you? I'm available on Twitter and LinkedIn. So slash Ryan Glasgow. Uh, so DMs are open. If you have any questions, definitely let me know. You can also just send me a note uh, and I'm happy to respond on Twitter. Uh, also messages on LinkedIn. We do have a special offer as well. Uh, so sprig.com slash tech trek. And so what, you know, we got 10% off for anyone who's interested in getting set up. We also have a free plan for those of you that are just getting started pre-product market fit. We want to build a relationship with folks early. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure to include some of those links. And uh, it's great that uh, hopefully people can sign up and take advantage of the product. Thank you for your time. Thanks for coming on and sharing. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. That's it for the episode. Uh, I'll be back again, different guests, different topic. Until then, two things. One, if you found the episode interesting, share it with somebody else. It's actually, you know, Ryan has a great background, dove into uh, his career and talking about Sprig and the product itself could probably be useful to a lot of people out there listening. So please share away and also like, subscribe, leave me a review. Let me know if you want me to cover a specific topic for you and I'll do my best to find a guest. Uh, Until next time. Thanks and goodbye.